The Lord be with you. Then let us pray. Mercifully and gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this day as we do for every day because every breath we breathe is your gift to us on this day. We thank you for the Sabbath day as we always do. We ask now for the gift of your spirit so that the things we do and say may be acceptable to you and appropriate and correct. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a comment, housekeeping of such, if you have suggestions for another series of this class, you have till Friday to get that suggestion in for consideration. I'm very grateful for the ones we've received. Uh, it hasn't been overwhelming, but it's been substantial in its worth. So that, um, but um, it's, you need to get your word in. This, this is an election year, you know, so you need need you get your opinion in. Second thing, we're here three more weeks, so it kind of works for us okay. Today we're talking about Luke, and we've been talking about four lights of the gospel. And in these four lights of the gospel, we're talking about how each of the four evangelists has a thing to say about the identity of Christ. Two of them have nativity sequences or narratives, and, and one has a theological narrative. That's John. That's next week. That's the last of the series. And, of course, there's Mark, who has no nativity narrative, but we talked about the whys and the wherefores that Mark would not feel it necessary at that moment when he was writing to do that kind of thing. He was interested in one thing, in the Christology of Christ, and he begins it by saying he is the Christ, the Son of God. That's the opening sentence of Mark. And you'll remember near the close, that just at the time of the crucifixion, the centurion, the pagan, the man who's probably crucified a hundred people, says as Jesus passes, surely this man was the Son of God. That was Mark's point all the way through the gospel. Incidentally, Mark also has what's been called the messianic secret. All through Mark, when neat things are happening, such as the transfiguration, Jesus is telling the disciples, don't tell anybody. Well, you know, we have a lot of baptized Christians who never said anything to anybody, but that wasn't what Mark was talking about. Mark was talking about don't tell anybody till after the resurrection because it's simply not understandable apart from from the resurrection. So this Mark has as his purpose the very incredible statement, surely this man was the son of God. And he does it with, a, with an exclamation point in the, next, in the last verses of the, of the next to last chapter. Now we come to Luke. And as secretive as Mark might have been, Luke is just simply a celebration. He starts with the nativity narratives, and we'll go to fuller there, but, you know, it finally comes to a point with the story we all know, and an angel, suddenly an angel appeared to the shepherds who were abiding in the fields, abiding, watching their flock by night, and an angel appears, and, he, and the angel says, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling groves. We all know it because every one of us had to stand up at a Christmas entertainment sometime years ago and recite those words. Amen? Yeah, we've done it. We've been there. All right, those words. He uses the word Savior. No other one of the four Gospels ever used that word, Savior. And he uses it twice. And that's all. Once the message of the angel, for unto you is born this day a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And then Mary, the mother of our Lord, seeing the Magnificat, he has shown to me great things, and holy is his name. He has regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. He has sent to his people, guess what? A Savior, Mary says. This is before Jesus is born. This is in the little village of Ein Karim. Some of you have been to Ein Karim. It rhymes with ice cream. And the best ice cream shop in Israel is right there at Ein Karim. So 
having been there many times, and the long walk up one hill to Mary's Spring and up another hill to John's birthplace and the ice cream shop's right in the middle. And I say, I'll see you when you get back. And I have the ice cream. Ein Karim is a little village outside of Jerusalem in what was called in even Old Testament days, the hill country. And that's where John the Baptist was, baptized, was born. And that's where Gabriel was pretty busy before he got around to Mary. Um, there's some neat lines in the story. Luke is an incredible storyteller. And there are great lines in this gospel lesson. Um, for example, he goes to Zechariah and he says to Zechariah, who is a priest in the temple, and while he's burning incense on his day to burn incense, the priest would, there were so many priests, they were divided into 20 teams. And when your team came up, usually twice a year, then you drew lots for what you got to do. Many didn't draw a lot to do anything. Um, but this day, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, draws the lot to burn incense in the Holy of Holies. So he's there, and he's burning incense, and the angel Gabriel appears. And the angel Gabriel tells him that his wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a child. Now, this is unbelievable. It's happened before. Do you remember when the angel came to Abraham and said, Sarah's going, and Abraham says, I don't know whether I believe this. And um, so does Zechariah. Zechariah says, you don't know how old we are. That's the TAV translation, Ted's authorized version. He said, you don't know how old we are. So, uh, and how am I going to know this is going to happen? That's actually what he says. Uh, how do I know this is going to happen? I'm old. And the angel says, and I'm Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God and I hear what God says. Do you understand me? And um, so this dialogue takes place. Now, then the angel goes to Nazareth, meets Mary at the well. You can go see Mary's well today. Uh, one of two places you can fight over which one it is. But um, they're both ancient. And um, it must be Mary's well because I've drunk from it several times from a, from a, from a, a uh, crowd cup. And I'm still well. So anyway, um, had to be Mary as well. Anyway, the um, angel Gabriel goes to Nazareth, and he tells Mary that she's to bear a son. And she says, impossible. She knows the birds and the bees. She knows it doesn't work that way. And, um, and Gabriel says, it'll be God's son. And so... Then he tells her, and by the way, your kinswoman, Elizabeth, is now several months pregnant, expecting a child. Mary immediately packs her bags, goes to Ein Karim, meets Mary at that well, that first site that's well up this hill. It's called the Magnificat Church today, and the Magnificat in about 60 language and tiles is all around the, the cave there. And... Um, Mary meets Elizabeth there, and when Elizabeth meets her, she, uh, she, Elizabeth greets her with, blessed are you, a young woman, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. You ever hear that before? It's a rosary prayer now, but um, it's Mary's greeting, uh, Elizabeth's greeting to Mary, and then she says, the child in my womb leaped for joy at the sound of your voice. In other words, John the Baptist, about to be born to Elizabeth, leaps in Elizabeth's womb at the sound of Mary's voice. Luke is the storyteller here. And so I'm spinning out essentially what Luke tells us as he gets us ready for the announcement of the angels and the birth of the Christ child. It's a marvelous kind of experience. And it happens just time after time, surprise after surprise. The, the word that comes in Luke's nativity narrative about the angels, the angel meets the shepherds in the field. Uh, by the way, we say it was the 25th of December, not till the 4th century did we say that. Fact of the matter is, 
probably in May or in late or in early fall, because I want to tell you, Jerusalem is right on the edge of the desert. And you know what happens on the desert at night? It gets frigidly cold. People in, in September and October, people in Jerusalem travel down the street with a scarf wrapped around their face, uh, at least their nose and their breath, because they're not used to that cold. I felt all right to me, but for them it's cold because a month before it was 110 at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so it's a wide sweep. Shepherds probably would not have been out in the field, probably in a cave. And that's what they'll show you when you go to Shepherd's Field. Anyhow, the shepherds are out in the field. An angel appears to them, and the angels, and they're startled. Uh, I don't know how many of us have seen a ghost, but that apparition unexpectedly can be frightening, and angels could be the same way. And so the angel says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Notice that phrase, all people. We'll come back to that too. The light in Luke is found in a word we would call today inclusiveness. Nobody in Luke's gospel is outside of the grace and the love of God. Unique to Luke. <laughs> Luke talks about the good Samaritan. Okay? To Jesus, in Jesus' day, there weren't any good Samaritans. But Luke talks about the good Samaritan. We'll talk some more about that in just a minute. But then the angel gives his message. And then the word Luke uses, suddenly. Luke will keep, I don't always use the phrase, but always, always he dumps things on us suddenly. It's not what we expected because the inclusiveness of God's grace is so wide. There's a hymn. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. You ever sung that hymn? All right. That's what Luke is telling us. That's the focus of light for Luke's gospel is the inclusiveness of the grace of God. Anyway, the angel gives his message, and you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. This shall be a sign to you. Suddenly is the word Luke uses. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host praising God as saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace, goodwill toward those with whom God is pleased. Now, that might be a redactor later that just drew a line on the width of God's mercy. Did you hear it drawn? In other words, shape up. Except all through Luke's gospel, a word seldom used in the other three gospels, even in John, the word a word seldom used is Sinner. Sinner. Luke's not afraid to use the word sinner because the grace of God is beyond that word. So Luke talks about sinners all the time, but he also talks about God's grace. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, Luke's letters to a person by the name of Theophilus Nobody knows whether there was a Theophilus or whether this is simply a, a title for a whole host of people like you and me, lovers of God, because that's what it means. Theophilus, lover of God. Now, <laughs> my name, Theodore, means gift of God, and you don't have to believe that. But Theophilus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't have to believe that either. <laughs> yeah, the gift. You're right. You're right, Marlon. So then, so then um, Luke is writing to Theophilus. Is that a specific person? Most scholars are swinging today to say it probably was. Because what Luke is addressing, listen to the prologue. And I've printed it for you. You don't have to listen. You can read it probably better than I can read it. Listen to this. This is verses 1 to 4 of Luke. 
since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed to us, on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully, from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things with which, about which you have been instructed. What's he tell us? It's the only gospel that really has an intentional prologue. And he tells us everything about what he's concerned about, never tells us who he is. So we've said since the second century, Luke, we've said since the second century, educated. We've said since the second century, physician. Um, we've said a number of things about Luke. But Luke never says that about himself. Anyway, what does he say? A host of things. First of all, he tells us there have been many attempts to write an orderly account. He doesn't use the word attempt, but I'll get to it in a minute. He says there are many attempts to write an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. But it seemed good to me after having started many things way back to the very beginning to write this account, which means to say there's some problems with the others. So he tells us we need a better account, and um, we, we've got plenty of them already. Well, we already know that Luke is the third, we think, the third to be written of the Gospels we have, and there were many others or parts of others that were written that we don't have this day. So Luke is commenting on the circumstances of the time. He's commenting on the fact that there are apparently are varying stories about Jesus, and there were. And he's talking about the fact that he's done this with research. Some other things we know about the writer. He is a master of the use of Greek. It is the best written Greek in the whole New Testament. Um, he uh, not only knows the Greek language, he knows how to use it in different circumstances when a certain construction is better one way than the other. He chooses the right one. So he's a master at the Greek, right? He's obviously an educated person. He's most likely not a Jew, but a Greek, a Gentile most likely. I say most likely because this is simply extrapolation for what we know. The other thing is certain about this is there are two books written to Theophilus in the book. The other one is the book of Acts. He begins the book of Acts by saying, in the first book, we told about this most excellent Theophilus. Now we're going to talk about the life of the church. And so it's just agreed without any significant dissent that these two books, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, are in fact by the same hand and may have been written as one scroll, later separated. Um, in fact, that's pretty much the judgment now. Anyhow, um, this is what we know about this fellow, and this is what he sets out to do. Now, there are those differences. Turn, if you will, to, to the graph next to your last page. I don't know where it is on yours, but... Uh, Okay. Should be near the end. Yeah. That's far too complicated, but I think I have the feeling that we're going to do something relatively soon on how the New Testament came to us. How, how did the Bible come to be written? We've done that before, but some weren't here when we did it. And now we're walking right into that problem called the synoptic problem. We have these four very different Gospels, three of them very much alike. Um, so how did that happen? If you just let me walk you through this graph momentarily. You'll see one circle says Luke, one circle says Matthew, one circle says Mark. It's believed. It's believed that Mark is the first of the Gospels that are written. 
It's then believed that Matthew is the second. And look, you'll see that that 41, 46% of Matthew comes from Mark. And I'll try to remember to bring a gospel parallel book that shows verbatim chunks of Mark appearing in Matthew and appearing also in Luke. It not only appears they had copies of Mark, but it appears they had them at hand while they were writing. Notice in the middle a, a group that goes that got lined to all three of these Gospels. Uh, they don't title it here, but that's, that's what scholars believe would have been the Q document, which is the German word quell. It means source. And it is believed that there was a Greek document of the sayings of Jesus. No, no continuous uh, sinews linking the stories together with context and, and uh, continuation. Just stories. And um, we'll talk about that, but not today particularly. Just a comment that then, then you'll notice that Luke has his own source. Look at Luke, and you'll see down at the bottom on the left-hand side, Luke, a document called L by scholars. And, and Matthew has a document called M, or Matthew's document. This is material that appears in Luke that doesn't appear anywhere else. Material that appears in Matthew that doesn't appear anywhere else. Just a couple, a, a thin line really right in the middle where Mark and Luke tend to have some spillover. But the main spillover is Mark to these two. It's called the synoptic problem. Um, each of the gospel writers has a specific, we talked about Mark. The issue is, this is the Christus, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God. That's Mark's singular point. And then with Matthew, we saw a gospel written in the midst of what was likely to have been a blend of Jewish and Christian believers, people who were converted to Christianity, who met in many synagogues until the Pharisees declared Christians to be heretics. And that was the disowning of this group. Matthew is writing to a blended group. Luke is probably not. He's probably writing, and we don't know for sure, but he's probably writing to primarily a Gentile group as he, Luke himself, is a Greek, a Gentile, and a believer. Just for interest, he notes that Theophilus has already been instructed in the faith. So he's not writing to tell Theophilus about Jesus. He already knows. He is apparently writing to broaden the theology of Theophilus. Who knows? We can only guess. Let me stop and see if there are questions. His nativity story is fun. I told you about the Annunciation to Zechariah, about Elizabeth bearing a son whose name will John. Name will be John. By the way, because Zechariah does not believe Gabriel, he can't speak. He is silent until the child is born. Gabriel says, you'll not speak until the child is born. So he's silent. Um, he can't go home and tell Elizabeth, guess what I heard today? Um, nothing. When he comes out from burning incense, he says nothing to the gathered crowd. Um, remember I said Luke, such a great storyteller. So he comes says nothing. Then we come to the birth of John the Baptist. And the people in the family, the family members, tell Elizabeth, that his name should be Zechariah in honor of his father, the priest. And Elizabeth, strangely, who hasn't supposedly seen this angel, says his name is John. And they argue with her. And Zechariah, Zechariah asks for a slate. And he writes, his name is John. The crowd is astounded. Happy life. Happy life. Yeah, <laughs> good, good letter. So that, so then, uh, Luke's nativity narrative is like a short opera. 
you know, something happens and the fat lady has to sing. You know, that kind of story. Well, in Luke's gospel, Zechariah's mouth is opened, his tongue is loosed, and he sings. He sings what is called the Benedict Commas. It appears three times in our hymnal, twice as a canticle, and a third time as a canticle uh, in our opening liturgy for morning prayer. Uh, the whole of Benedict Commas, that great thing. Sounds a little like Old Testament stories too, doesn't it? Anyhow, then, uh, then we get to Mary, and Mary, once Elizabeth tells her that the child in her womb leaps for joy at the sound of her voice, Mary breaks into song, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he who is mighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name. This is Mary, um, and she breaks into song. Oh, we sing that one a lot. Uh, there, it's actually three different versions are listed as hymns in the ELW, and it appears in our, in our morning and evening prayers as well. So it's very popular in the life of the church. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. We have a hymn tune which has a real beat to it, like our closing hymn today. And we have a hymn tune that just flows along. Oh, we got the Magnificat every way. But Mary sang that song. Then we've got the angels singing the Gloria in excelsis. Glory to God in the highest, that on earth, peace. And then the day of purification comes. They don't seem to sing when the shepherds come, and Luke doesn't even know about the wise men. When we get to the synoptic problem, we'll talk about how those things happen. And you might say, well, which one happened? Well, I think they both did, but we'll get to why when we get there. So then finally we come to, to um, the visit of Mary to the temple for the rites of purification after birth, and she takes the Christ child, and they encounter an old man by the name of Simeon. Now, Simeon has been promised by God that he will not die until he sees the salvation of Israel. That's a promise he's had in a dream. And he happens to come to church that day. In fact, I remember a sermon very vividly preached at a synod convention years ago. And it was simply entitled in the bulletin, The Day Simeon Went to Church. It was a neat sermon. Okay. Simeon goes to the temple because the Spirit has tempted him to go. So he goes. When Mary and Joseph walk in with the Christ child, he runs and he, and he sings this song. Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you've seen before all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. What's this light to lighten the Gentiles stuff? I told you surprises in Luke. You just got to watch for them. No question it'd be glory to Israel. But a light to lighten the Gentiles? This infant is going to do that? So we see in this story as it unfolds, this purposefulness of God, which Luke holds as no secret from the very beginning. Savior, Luke says. You know, when the Palm Sunday procession begins, and all four Gospels tell us about it, when the Palm Sunday service begins, procession begins, the people shout, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name. Hosanna, save us, in translation. So that what we hear again and again and again uh, is this sense that God is at work, working the salvation of his people. What's the unique spotlight Luke shines on the gospel is that it is for everybody and not just a chosen few. So, we have Simeon's song, um, which talks about the praise of God. You remember the story of Zacchaeus? I love Zacchaeus because 
He was short, and he climbed a tree to see a parade. And I've always had to stand on somebody's shoulders to see what's going on in this world. And Zacchaeus, a friend of mine, Zacchaeus is up a tree, probably because he feared, he was a tax collector, he's probably up the tree for two reasons, one to see Jesus, and the other is not to be in the midst of the crowd, because taxpayers weren't loved. At any rate, Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, he sees him in the tree, I'll have dinner at your house tonight. And Zacchaeus takes him home. I did that to Doris a few times, too. Somebody would stop in and say, why don't you go buy a house for dinner? Anyway, Zacchaeus takes him home, and Zacchaeus is so moved. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the outcast, the, well, you know, tax collector, who got his job by high bidder to Rome. You know who pays for the high bid? You me. Um, so he takes him home and Zacchaeus is moved. He said, if I have defrauded anyone, I'll return it fourfold. The law required twofold. He's beaten the law. He's raised the law twice. Jesus' response to this tax collector is, today, salvation has come to this house. Who tells us this story? Matthew? No. Mark? No. John? No. Luke? Yes. Similarly, um, we have the disciples come to Jesus and a Samaritan town has not received them. Now, it was unusual that a faithful Jew would go through Samaria at all. But they were doing that. But there was one particular Samaritan town who simply said, no way. You know, you hate us, we hate you. And so the disciples begged Jesus to call fire down on that town. And Jesus says, no. Who tells us this? Matthew? Mark? John? No. Luke? Yeah. And then uh, and then of course there's the story of the good Samaritan the one who takes care of the man who fell among thieves and notice how Jesus tells the story the first person down the line is a priest the second is a Levite. Both of these people ordained people in the temple. And, and, um, then, and they both passed by on the other side of the road. They kind of looked the other way. They didn't see him. And, you know, the Levites got to open the temple and the, and the priests got to conduct it. They have things to do. They have to keep going. And then comes a Samaritan, the last person in the world to care about a Jew near death along the road to Jericho. He not only takes him to the inn. By the way, you can go, they'll take you to the inn of the good Samaritan, which I find funny because this is a parable. There never probably was a good Samaritan in this store like this. Anyway, he takes them to the inn gives him his American Express card, says, if there's anything you don't have, I'll pay you when I come back through. <laughs> you know, there's two things about the story. The innkeeper trusts the Samaritan. That's a pretty good part of the story, too. At any rate, just the title between the Samaritan becomes the good Samaritan. Am I making any sense at all? This is Luke. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God is wide. Now, maybe we shouldn't be surprised about that because Luke's a Gentile, we think. He's speaking to a Gentile community, we think. These were people that were outside of the chosen few. So Luke is particularly 
concern that they hear that the gospel is for us too. The gospel includes us. So at any rate, um, let's see if I've covered most of what we talked about, what I talked about here. I did. There are other stories. Um, you remember every time Jesus ate with the Pharisees, or with others, the scribes, not with the Pharisees, I mean with tax collectors, with sinners, with others who were outcasts, which he tended to do a lot in Luke, not, not so much elsewhere. And the scribes and the Pharisees would complain vociferously about his eating with sinners. On one occasion, he stops and he tells them three parables. Which one of you who has a hundred sheep and has lost one does not leave the hundred and search out for the one that's lost? Which one of you who has lost a coin does not call in the neighbors to help find it and then rejoice that they found the lost coin. And then he tells the story about the lost son, sometimes known to us as the good, as the prodigal son. That Helmut Thielke, a theologian now dead, but very prominent preacher in post-war Germany, Lutheran, I might add, Helmut Thielke writes a book called The Waiting Father and said it's not the prodigal son, it's the waiting father. That father had let his son know that if he wasted the riches and all the other things, somehow that father had gotten through to him, he still could come home. No matter where he'd gone, no matter what he had done, no matter how ashamed the family, he could still come home. It's not about the waiting, it's not about the prodigal son, it's about the waiting father. And you know, the son said when he's finally broke and he no longer has any friends because he can't buy beer for them. And um, so he says, I know what I'll do. I will go back home and I will say to my father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Let me just work as one of your servants never got to give the speech. Read the story. His father sees him coming along the road, runs out to greet him, embraces him. And then we've got another story about the elder son who's really ticked off about God's grace going so far. This son of yours, he says. Luke tells stories like you can't believe. You just got to take a little time to read them. Three lost things. And then in case they had missed the point, he said about the first two parables, truly I tell you, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety and nine who need no repentance. What's the focus? What's the beam of light on Luke's gospel? The incredible, almost unbelievable love of God. I began to preach about midway through my career uh, about this, saying you've got to be a parent. Because I swore to kill my kids several times. They're now in their 50s. Uh, and they're great-grandchildren. So, you know... Why didn't I do that? Because they were good? No, not always. They're mine. There's this marvelous phrase in Isaiah. I have created you. You are mine. You've heard it said in the New Testament, we learn of the love of God. In the Old Testament, we learn of the judgment of God. No, no, no. It's the same God. He's not, he's, not, 
He's not a psychopath. It's the same God, both places. We studied in the book of the 12 prophets a prophet by the name of Hosea, who was married to an unfaithful wife by the name of Gomer. And we learned the heartbreak of God. That's Old Testament. So we can't say there's a the God of anger in the Old Testament, the God of love in the New Testament. No, it's the same guy or gal. I'm sorry, Doris, I just had to say that. <laughs> anyway, any questions before I just launch off very briefly on, on a comment about the first century? The f f four points of light. Luke's point of life is grace of God. Yes, Marlon. I'll come back, Marilyn. I'm sorry, Marlon. Can you speak up a little bit? Yes, but they have some Hebrew roots. Luke shows none. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Linda? Well, he had some gifts, didn't he? I think it's before we moved into the age of specialization where the medical fees rise. We had our cat at the veterinarian, and he's carrying, he's an older cat we adopted, and he's carrying this, this bulge underneath, and we, we said to the veterinarian, what's this suitcase he carries? Underneath, and the veterinarian grabbed his belly. He says, just a little overweight. <laughs> Anyhow, about the first century, most of us don't think much about how we got the Bible. Most of us believe it is the inspired word of God. Most of us believe, not most of us, many of us might believe that the Holy Spirit, in a moment of trauma, wrote whole books, and that's how we got them. And if you want to believe that, that's fine. Truth of the matter is, I believe the definition of the Bible is, it's the history of our human relationship with God. We have told the stories that helped us know and understand God. It came out of our lives it goes back into our lives again. Luke is telling us how he has heard Jesus Christ, although clearly he was not an eyewitness. But Luke is interpreting for us as he sees the functioning grace of God. Remember this. In the first century, on the day that Jesus ascended, he commanded he commanded the disciples to go back to Jerusalem and be in prayer and wait till the coming of the Holy Spirit. You remember that line? That also Luke wrote. Um, what's important about that? What's important about that is that worship began not as soon as the ELW got printed. Worship began day one. Prayer began day one. Paul comes 20 years after the ascension, roughly. All right? Two decades almost. That's when Paul comes. The church has been worshiping as a gathered body before Paul is ever converted. And it's been doing so for two decades. There was a liturgy for Holy Communion that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians and, and does a bit of preaching for a chapter saying, when you celebrate the Eucharist, it is not Holy Communion you're celebrating. And he tells them why. Because you're not, you're not respecting the presence of the body of Christ, meaning the church. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's theology. There is 
There is Christology, and there is liturgy. Paul tells us about the resurrection appearances. It doesn't match anything Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It was some oral tradition that Paul had that apparently they didn't have. So that by the time Paul writes letters, there's still no gospel. There's no Mark, there's no Matthew, there's no Luke, there's no John. Paul starts writing, and his letters become the earliest books in the New Testament. The church has lived all this time till 63 in Paul's death. The church has lived all this time with oral tradition, getting aside to each other and telling the story, one to the other, as we heard it. Out of this grew what we call now the New Testament. Luke may not have been written until 90. Some go as far as 110. I don't. I squeeze 90 out of it. Um, but the, the bottom line is the church, the church preaching and teaching in itself, in its prayer meetings, in its places in hiding in the, in the catacombs of Rome and in private houses and in other places, many times secret because it was Nero that started the persecutions in the 60s. So that, so that um, from then on, the church couldn't even turn the lights on at night when they had a meeting, you know, so to speak. All I'm trying to say is that has something to do with this chart, where things came from and why and how they were put together. I haven't said I will do that the next series, but I might. <laughs> it's because that was one of the suggestions, and, and I realize as we've, dealt with the Gospels and begin to see how different they are, how these four lights of the Gospel, four points of light, how different they are, you've got to have the question, how come? And what it comes is the incredible faith of people who risk their lives to tell one another about Jesus. And if that doesn't inspire you, you are dead. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs>